Hi, I am Rachel Romeliotis. I am a senior editor here at O'Reilly, and I am pleased to be talking with Guido Van Rossum, the creator of Python. Thanks for joining me. Hello, Rachel. Okay, we're going to get right to the questions. First of all, I'm very interested in knowing, uh, how are people pushing the limits of what Python can do today? Well, let's see. There, there are all sorts of limits. Uh, some limits are, for example, uh, scaling up. Uh, I think probably the best example of that currently is YouTube, which is, I think it's the world's third largest website. Uh, it's one of the largest video sites for sure. Uh, all its user interface is implemented in Python. So whenever someone clicks on a video, they will see HTML that was generated from Python, by Python. Mm. So I would say that is definitely pushing the limits of Python. Uh, one of their lead engineers gave a great, great key talk at uh, the last Python, Python conference uh, in San Jose, Santa Clara, uh, which is actually uh, available on YouTube. Mm. Okay. So you can look for that. Great. Uh, yeah, other things. Uh, Another, what I think is a very interesting example of pushing the limits is Dropbox, which is also a commercial company that's actually the Dropbox clients for, uh, for Mac OS, Windows, and Linux are all implemented in Python. Hmm. Uh, when, when you download Dropbox, you actually get a mini version of the entire Python runtime uh, oh, wow. downloaded as part of that. Uh, other areas where people are pushing the limits is in uh, library development. Uh, and things like uh, if you've sort of paid attention to the, the, the trolling and griping about Python, you might have heard of the global interpreter log, the GIL. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, Armin Rigo, who is, I think, the smartest brain in the entire Python developer community, uh, is working on uh, a completely different thinking out of the box approach to uh, changing the way we think about parallel uh, code in Python using software transactional memory. Uh, that's a very unproven thing, but uh, given that Armin uh, thinks it's possible, I am really glad that, that he's sort of taking the time to, in, to research that and try and come up with uh, working implementation. So I'm really looking forward that, to that. Although it, it may be one or two years before we have uh, usable results. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're going to see a lot more continue, a lot more people continue to push the limits. Absolutely. So, uh, do you have any tips for developers that are looking to get more performance out of their Python code? Uh, funny you should ask. Uh, completely independent of this, about a week ago, I, was, I somehow, I think I received an email from someone who said, do you have any tips for uh, speeding up Python programs? And I, I sort of quickly fired off uh, five or six of my uh, common recommendations. Oh, okay. Let's hear them. Uh, and, and then I, I turned it into a thread on G+. And, okay. Uh, for, some, for some reason, uh, it got like close to 1,000 uh, shares or approvals. Uh, so some of the most important things to, to enumerate there are uh, don't Overuse objects. Objects are great, but for your smallest data items, the built-in uh, Python objects are usually much faster. Things like tuples, dictionaries, lists, or if you want to give your names to the attributes of your objects, uh, you can use name tuple, which is a very clever little uh, performance hack. Uh, I don't think I would like to sort of go into all the all the various rules that came up, and every every rule has its its exceptions and its sort of fans and detractors. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I would mention that in general, sort of, if all else fails, you can write a small amount of uh, rewrite a small amount of your program using C code or C mm. uh, or some other systems programming language, uh, and of course. When you're using Python's built-in objects, you're already using that that strategy. Python string operations are all implemented in C, for example. So searching strings is blindingly fast. The same for dictionaries. You can't get a faster hash table uh, implemented yourself compared to Python dictionaries. Right. So if you if you really have an absolute performance bottleneck and 
by all means, first make sure that you do have a performant bottleneck by doing proper profiling and stuff like that. Right. Uh, then uh, it makes sense to uh, start rewriting a small part of your code in, in C. And that's actually uh, a strategy that the YouTube folks have also perfected. Most okay. YouTube developers never write any C code, but they have a small team of people who occasionally write and maintain uh, extension modules that are used by the rest of the YouTube developers. Mm -hmm. And I'll make sure in my post to direct people to your uh, your post as well. Awesome. So, um, you know, something that we've, uh, we're going to have a book coming out on soon is NumPy and SciPy. What do you think about those? I think that's that's an absolutely great development. Uh, the NumPy has been around for a long time. I think the first time there was something called numeric Python probably was in 95 or 96. Oh, wow. Uh, Jim Uginen, who has uh, done many other great things in the Python uh, world, was the first to uh, start thinking about that. The current generation of NumPy has almost nothing in common with that except the idea of sort of implementing fast array operations uh, in C, but invocable from Python in such a way that you can also communicate with existing algorithms and libraries implemented in C++ mm -hmm. or even Fortran is, is pretty popular. I, I think NumPy and SciPy are absolutely wonderful projects and uh, I'm really glad to see that sort of Python is really taking off in the scientific community yes, definitely. through the efforts of all the different NumPy and SciPy developers. Yeah, it's really great. Uh, okay, and here's a big question. What are your thoughts on the uh, Python 2, Python 3 divide that's still going on out, out there? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I, I could have expected that question, of course. It's yeah. always on everyone's mind. Uh, on the one hand, uh, I would say to people who are currently happy with Python 2, uh, if they're happy with what they have, uh, there's no need to panic or even get worried or uh, care much about the transition. On the other hand, if you want improvements to your Python, if you want a faster Python, a better Python, if you're not happy with your current Python 2 experience, uh, then now is the time to uh, start trying out Python 3. The differences between the two versions of the language are actually pretty small. Uh, there are a few small syntactic tweaks that are all designed to make uh, make it less likely that beginners fall into certain uh, common traps. Uh, there are a couple of sort of refactorings of standard library modules uh, to make the namespace more logical. Mm -hmm. uh, the big thing is that Unicode handling has been completely overhauled and is much better. Uh, if if you have a bug in your in your program that has to do with how you treat Unicode, you'll find out right away. Rather than uh, being able to test everything and believe everything is working, mm -hmm. and then finding out in the field that the first time a user enters a name with uh, an accented character in it, mm -hmm. uh, your application is not uh, behaving properly. So that's sort of. What, what has kept people back from switching to Python 3 quickly has been the fact that you actually have to make changes to your code in order to use it. There's, there's no sort of free transparent upgrade path. Sure. And so if you're writing new Python code only, that's great. You can start using the new version. And people in classrooms have actually been the first uh, people to, to adopt, adapt, uh, to adopt uh, Python 3. What you see in most cases, however, is that people don't just use Python and the standard library, they also use a whole slew of third-party packages, whether that is uh, web frameworks from Django to Flask or uh, uh, actually libraries like NumPy, uh, many other packages. Mm -hmm. So what, what we had to wait for was to get to the, get to the point where most of the third-party software that's available for Python also has a Python 3 version. Right. And in turn, often, uh, well, Django is an exception because they don't have any dependencies. On the other hand, most other uh, third-party software itself has dependencies on yet another piece of third-party software. And so there is sort of 
you have to you have to wait until someone else does their job of porting their little package to pipe of feed right. before you can start working on your porting project and so then there is the matter of sort of are there any users who are demanding pipe of feed yet and, and sort of everybody is waiting for the what for the other one to jump first sure uh through various, mostly social mechanisms, we've actually made an incredible progress in that area. For example, uh, I assume that if, you, if you've looked into NumPy and SciPy, you know that NumPy has a, a fairly good Python 3 support uh, mm -hmm. in their standard distribution now. Uh, Django, uh, who when Python 3 was first announced, uh, one of their lead developers said something like, I will be the last person still coding in Python, 3, Python 2 because our users are uh, so reluctant to upgrading. That may still be true, but nevertheless, Django has announced Python 3 support right. in the next upcoming release. Mm -hmm. uh, you see the same thing all over the map. Uh, there are a few packages that uh, didn't have an active maintainer where uh, the Python Software Foundation actually fu funded uh, the port uh, by giving some developer a few thousand dollars mm -hmm. who would uh, spend their time on this particular uh, project. So all in all, I think, I mean, I've, I've seen this make progress over the years and I really have a feeling that with large third party packages now on the bandwagon uh, we'll, we'll see a, a sort of cascading effect where more and more people are using Python 3 and it becomes more and more acceptable to only support Python 3 and less and less uh, sort of politically correct to uh, stick on Python 2. Right. And you, you sort of, this is a good segue actually into the next question. It's about the Python mm -hmm. community. And so you, show, you talked about, you know, the third party um, packagers. What about the individual developers? Have they uh, had anything to do with the evolution, whether, you know, wanting to keep it at the 2.7 level or, you know, 3.4 you know, and beyond? Uh, by individual developers, you mean the, the sort of the end users of the language? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, we, we, we tried to take everyone's feedback into account. I mean, the Python 3 project was initiated not just because we wanted mm. to do something different, but because there were sort of, there were well-known language wards, sort of little traps that, that users would fall into that we really wanted to fix. Uh, but we didn't see a way mm. to fix them without somehow breaking backwards compatibility. I think mm. the Unicode uh, changes was probably mm. the biggest one. Because the original sort of, in retrospect, bad way of handling Unicode was all done in the sake of backwards compatibility. Mm -hmm. So to, to fix that, we would have to break backwards compatibility in a pretty major way. Right. So you could say it was driven by the community then? Uh, it was inspired by by sort of problems that, that kept coming up in mm -hmm. the community. Yeah, I mean, I would say that the core developer community has driven the process, but we've, we've sort of, we've had many, many, many discussions where people from sort of all levels of eagerness or reluctance to adopt new things uh, got, got their say, and we came up with sort of promises to the community about how long Python 2 will still continue to be supported. Mm -hmm. Because even though we don't add new features to Python 2, we do release bug fix releases. Now, they are truly bug fix releases. They're not sort of, they don't secretly add new features mm -hmm. anyway. But we do fix bugs, uh, and, and we will be doing that for many years to come, including Good. security bugs. Good to know. Uh, final question. What do you see coming up next for Python? Uh, ah, yeah, that's that's the question I never never quite know. Yeah. Uh, that I, I somehow I don't have a very good crystal ball. I sort of I look at what's going on right now and I think it's all great and then sort of I make small evolutionary steps and somehow uh, looking back five years something big has happened. Uh, let's see. Well, so next I see much larger adoption of Python 3. Uh, Python 3.3, .3, which is about to be released, 
uh, it's possible that by the time your video actually uh, gets published, it has been released. The mm -hmm. second release candidate came out uh, one or two weeks ago. So that's that's very close to being released. Uh, that's that's the next big thing because that that's actually a very good release that introduces lots of new functionality. A mm -hmm. uh, couple of real pain points in the implementation have been uh, solved. A couple of things have been made much faster. Memory footprint of strings has been reduced. Uh, memory footprint of dictionaries has been, has been reduced in some very common cases. Uh, there are a couple of new uh, libraries, new, a few small new bits of syntax. The new syntax is probably the least important for most of the users, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think it's a rock solid, uh, very important release. So every, everyone who is sort of considering Python 3 should definitely go uh, use Python 3.3 and not any of the older releases if they can. Of course, if you're currently using Python 3.2, there's no need to immediately abandon that. But uh, if if you've been on Python 2, say 2.7 or 2.6, mm -hmm. and you're looking forward to Python 3, jump to Python 3.3 right away, because you're, you're going to really like that release. Sounds good. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining me, and hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. Sure. You're welcome. All right. The thank you. It's all mine.